uh, cyclical living, well, it's essentially it's, it's quite simple. It's living in tune with the seasons of our life. So whether that's the moon cycle, our inner cycles, so the menstrual cycle, and nature seasons as well, so the seasons around us. Um, and just instead of, I don't know, I feel like it's easy just to be disconnected from essentially these beautiful cycles that hold us and support us and they give us um, a direct line back to ourselves, a checking in point, our groundedness. Um, and to be honest, I really find it's like a mindfulness practice every day working, you know, if you're going to use, for example, your menstrual cycle. So um, if you do have a natural bleed and um, you figure out which day of your cycle you're on, so day one is the first day of your flow. Um, and then, you know, each day just checking in and you might use an app or you might use a journal um, and asking yourself, you know, how are you feeling physically, how are you feeling emotionally, mentally and spiritually perhaps. Um, and then also going on to say, ask yourself, how can you show up for yourself today in this version of yourself? Welcome to The Balance Theory, a podcast aimed at arming you with tools and tips so that you are well equipped to not only identify and define, but own your own definition of balance. I'm your host, Erica, and thank you for joining me today. Hey, balancers, and welcome back to episode 60 of The Balance Theory podcast. I just want to start by thanking you for choosing to spend your time with me. And not only that, but thank yourself for turning up to listen, learn and grow. And I hope you've been loving all the incredible guests we've had on. I've had a lot of you reaching out saying you're really interested in episodes that dive specifically into women's health. So this week and next is going to be just that. We have a specific focus on female health from two experts in their field. So you guys are going to absolutely love that. So thank you to everybody who has reached out with that feedback and request. I am a very open book. I am here to bring knowledge to us all to be shared, used and spread for our own balance. So if there is something you really want to hear or topics you want to hear more of, less of anything like that, please don't be shy. You can reach out and the best place to do so is on Instagram. So you can follow us at The Balance Theory and I always reply to my DMs. So don't be shy. Speaking of hearing from you guys, you know, I absolutely love connecting with you all, but one of the best ways I get to do that, or I guess get to see a little bit about who's on the other side of the microphone, who's actually listening, you who've got these headphones in your ears right now, or got me plugged into your car or your speaker. The best way I get to do that not only is via you reaching out to me and messaging, but also through reviews. And I couldn't help myself but to read out this review because it was so beautiful and it really, really made my whole week. So this one is from Adele Hana and it reads, as cliche as this might sound, this podcast has really brought balance into my life, a refreshing perspective that doesn't make you feel like you need to have it all figured out in order to have balance, super handy tips and tricks that are actually achievable to take away with you through all parts of life. The celebrity guests that are chosen for this podcast are great quality, but the Monday Muse episodes truly bring this raw and unique mental opening to my life. The content in Monday Muses is extremely gender fluid. I share them with my partner all the time and he finds them so helpful. Sometimes we'll even quote them because of how relevant they can be to everyday life. Wow. Thank you so much for leaving that review. It really means the world to me. And again, really just helps me understand who's on the other end of the mic. And I'd love to hear the one liners you guys share with each other or quote in your day to day life. I think that would be so cool to hear on my end. So feel free to reach out and let me know as well. But thank you so much, Adele, and for everybody else who has also left a review. Now on to today's guest, I am joined by Chloe Shivers, who is a naturopath from New Zealand. And today we do a deep dive into some really interesting topics in the female health space, as I mentioned before. So a big focus of not only Chloe's work, but today's chat is all about vaginal health, which interestingly has a very unique link with gut health. And that's not something I've actually heard on another podcast before. And so I was really curious and keen to dive into this with Chloe today. And I guess how that feeds into some of the other more common issues that women experience. And also, if you're a male tuned into this episode, it might be a really good way for you to build some empathy or I guess understanding for partner, daughters, anything like that. So don't feel like you can't listen to this episode, but we really do talk about some of the common issues and how to be preventative as well as treatment when they come up. So some of you may or may not have had something like thrush before. Um, So she explains why that actually comes up and how we can use some more natural remedies when that happens, which is something I am big on. 
And another really cool area we speak about is the impact of diet on the balance of your bacteria and then how that has a direct effect on the different experiences you may have. We also then have a whole section on cyclical living, which is something some of you may have heard before. So I think episode 13, where I had another brilliant health coach on, we similarly spoke about cyclical living, so living with your period, but we also spoke about how that could be something more natural like the moon or another natural season as a really grounding practice to be, I guess, more aligned with nature. She shares the intelligence behind the Horopito plant, which is the first time I've heard of it, but it really blew my mind to see how something that has adapted to its environment in nature can actually be used when it comes to female health. And as it kind of replicates what it does in nature to within our bodies was like really, really mind blowing. And then we also have a little segment at the end about conception and fertility. So if you're at any stage in that process, I suppose, if you're thinking about conceiving, if it's something you're thinking about in a couple of years, like myself, um, we, we talk about, I guess, how to really optimize that experience. And I think the best part here for me, um, I guess is something being a little bit further in my future, but was just picking up some cool tips and tricks of things we can be doing well and truly before we're even falling pregnant. So really trying to optimize that health before we get our bodies ready to have a baby. I know you guys are going to get so much out of today's chat. You can connect with Chloe more through the Colorex website, which is the company she works for. I've popped a link in the show notes below, but feel free to DM me or tag me on Instagram. Let me know what your biggest takeaways were. And as always, if you have a moment or two to leave a review, it would be super special. And I always love hearing who's on the other side of the headphones. Enjoy today's chat and get ready for another episode next week as well, all on female health. But let's dive straight in. Alrighty, Balancers. Today I am joined by Chloe Shivers. A very warm welcome to the Balance Theory podcast. I know we had a couple of technical issues getting on the line today, but it's a pleasure to have you on the show. A big welcome to you. Ah, oh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Likewise, and you're streaming all the way from New Zealand. Tell us where you're where you're listening or tuning in from. Yes, yes. Um, top of the South Island in New Zealand, in a town called Nelson. Beautiful. Not too far from the Abel Tasman National Park, which lots of people know. So, yeah. Amazing. So I'm excited to have you on today because we're going to be talking about an area that I haven't really gone into depth with on the podcast. So I've had a lot of other guests on that dive into gut health and we've done some women's health specific topics before, but never have I sort of gone into uh, the area that we'll be talking about today. So just to front run our conversation, can you share with the listeners just a little bit about who you are and what you specialize in? Yes, absolutely. So I am the in-house naturopath for Colorex, um, also known as like a health advisor. And um, so I'm a naturopath. I studied naturopathy in Australia, actually. I, I lived in Australia for 10 years. Um, and yes, yeah, I specialize in reproductive health, vaginal health, emotional wellness, um, and I also bring a lot of cyclical living and menstrual cycle awareness into my naturopathy practice as well. And um, I love working with Colorex, especially because they're opening up the conversations around vaginal health, thrush, and how we can care for our vulvas and our vaginas. Yeah, amazing. And I think it's uh, a conversation well worth having and one we don't actually speak openly enough about. But I'm curious, what sort of um, led you to specialize in this? Because I know naturopaths, they do tend to end up specializing. Was this something you were always passionate about or did you find just through your practice, it was just areas you were working on? Yeah, um, so actually a lot of it was my personal journey. I actually had a chronic thrush for a couple of years back um, maybe seven years ago now and so I was trying to figure out what was causing it and I was on a healing journey myself so I through that I think I became very in tune with my own vaginal health which then I think when you go through something personally that you then want to help others as well um, because you know you can connect with it so there's definitely a personal journey with um, focusing on vaginal health for sure. Amazing. And so through your personal experience and no doubt further studies, can you explain to us what is the link between vaginal health and gut health? Because it's not one I've actually thought to consider. Um, just, mm. just for a little bit of background, me and myself this year, for the first time I realized that you can actually have thrush or thrush symptoms from something as simple as stress or what you're eating. Yes. And so this is so interesting yeah. and it's a new concept I suppose in my head so I would love for you to share I guess what the link is there absolutely well you've probably heard about the gut brain axis before have you Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so the connection our gut has with our brain so and 
more and more research and information is coming out about the connection between our gut and our vagina. So it's the gut-vagina axis, essentially. Um, and, I mean, the gut is connected to everything. We, you know, our systems and our body aren't isolated and sit there on their own. Everything is interlinked. Everything influences each other. And so if we can work on our gut health, it's actually going to reduce whole body inflammation, which will then go on to promote a healthy vagina. Um, and there is also a translocation of microbes from the gut that do get into the vagina as well. Um, so there, there are studies done that show that if you take a probiotic, you will then see some of those microbes pop up in the vagina as well. Um, and sometimes we do get translocation of um, not the so good microbes, so the opportunistic microbes like thrush, like yeast. Um, and interesting enough, actually, the vagina has some microbes that the gut doesn't have. Um, and yeah, the vagina is predominantly lactobacilli, whereas the gut has more, um, a lot broader range of microbes. Um, but they definitely influence, influence each other. So, you know, if we can look after our gut health, um, it's definitely going to have a knock on effect to our vaginal health for sure. Yeah, amazing. And I definitely can understand what you're saying when you say the translocation because I've had an experience yeah. and often I actually find if I'm on antibiotics, I will, that will be followed directly by like a, a period of thrush. And I've always found that yes, to be quite yes. strange. But um, other than, say, inflammation to look out for or, or as, I guess, a, a cofactor of what goes on in the gut, which then translates into the vagina, what else would be directly implicated? So are we talking like the bacteria that's in there? Has it got anything to do with, I mean, I don't really know the technical terms, but kind of what exact things are we looking out for that are directly impacted? Yeah, so um, between gut health and vaginal health, yeah. is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, um, look, like you mentioned before with antibiotics, so um, you're so right that like often after a course of antibiotics, say if you had a UTI, um, it, you're going to see actually a reduction in the lactobacilli, the good bacteria, both in the gut and in the vagina. Um, and so really like um, stress, like you mentioned as well, that also can disrupt the microbiome too. So, um, and like stress has an impact on all systems of our body. Yeah, it's and, crazy. And um, as you know, like with, it's one of those things too, like we, we can't eliminate stress completely from our lives. We, actually, stress is a really amazing response that our body has. Um, but it's when we live in constant chronic stress that goes on for months and years that we start to see the negative impacts on our health, including our microbiome. Mm. Um, so really trying to reduce that cortisol response is going to make a really big difference. Um, and then also like blood glucose regulation. So there's blood sugar levels in our body as well. So um, if we can really look at our diet and have, you know, really balance it out with healthy proteins, healthy fats, carbohydrates, like, you know, our vegetables are whole fruits. Uh, I don't recommend fruit juices. Um, it's going to spike the blood sugar too much. And some people, if they're in, say they had chronic thrush, they might want to reduce fruit for a while um, but it's not necessary to always go on a really strict anti-candida diet uh, for a lot of people that can actually create more stress mm. so it's really just about really looking at any like like you've mentioned some, on some of your other podcasts I listened to a few you know diet is really unique to each person as well so I don't really have a you know a specific protocol yeah. for you but you know, it's really like what 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 foods do you digest best? Really having ba that balance of the proteins, the fats, the carbohydrates, reducing sugar spikes, reducing alcohol, um, having enough fiber as well to because fiber feeds our bacteria. And looking at the both the probiotic and the prebiotic foods because the prebiotic foods, so like onions, leek, garlic, um, oats, bananas, those fibers and those foods actually feed the good bacteria in our guts. Yeah. Well, that's actually quite um, good to hear because I think sometimes it gets really complicated if we have to eat for our gut, for our recovery, for our vaginal health. You know, when, when things become too complicated, yes. it becomes like a, a too hard thing to do. So that's kind of music to yes. my ears to hear that if we're just eating for our gut and I guess what's already working for our optimal health as is, that's probably going to be best for our vaginal health as well. But would there be any, yes. are there any foods in particular that are 
favorable to um, overall vaginal health? Or would you just say it's a clear cut, whatever is just works for you for your optimal health is a green tick for vaginal health as well yeah yeah look i probably would say what works overall for your health what you're digesting absorbing well what makes you feel good and energized that's probably going to have a really positive knock-on effect to your vaginal health um and i think as long as what you're eating you've got good bowel clearance so you're going toilet every day healthy stools then Ultimately, that will um, have another positive knock-on effect to your vaginal health as well because it's clearing out that estrogen out of your body. Yeah. Because what can happen is, um, so like th- uh, thrush, which is a fungus, that can thrive in an estrogen-rich environment. So estrogen, it's, to keep it simple, estrogen controls the levels of glycogen in the vagina. And what happens is yeast will actually feed on that glycogen. So if you have the more estrogen you have in your body, the more the yeast will feed and actually can overgrow. Mm -hmm. So having good estrogen balance in the body um, so that you really want to be looking at liver clearance of estrogen, so supporting the liver and bowel clearance of estrogen so you're not reabsorbing the estrogen back into your body is going to have a really good impact on your vaginal health um, and reduce those overgrowths of yeast um, that can happen in, a, in an estrogen-rich environment. If it's, estrogen's healthy, we want good estrogen, but not, not you know, um, we don't want to get rid of estrogen at all. It's such an important hormone. Um, but it's, you know, like anything, when things are out of balance, then you're gonna, you might start to see some, you know, negative symptoms. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I know you did mention thrush, and um, I know a big part of that is that overgrowth of candida. Um, maybe you can talk to us mm. a little bit about what actually is thrush, so what's actually going on, and maybe just some of the most common symptoms. Because, I mean, is this, is this probably one of the more common things that women experience in terms of um, like an imbalance in the vagina? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it is one of the most common infections. Though in saying that, it's um, not as common as bacterial vaginosis, which is an uh, overgrowth of bacteria. Um, but a thrush infection is still very, very common. I think about 75% of women will get thrush once in their lifetime. Yeah, wow. So, you know, which is quite high. And it is very common after antibiotics. Um and, you know, that can, it can just really take quite a thrashing on the microbiome with the antibiotics. That makes sense why, you know, when you have that shift in the vaginal environment, the candida essentially, it's opportunistic and it goes, oh, abs- this is awesome. I'm going to start thriving and really overgrow. Because um, it's kind of you know, like, that's when you're- cause it's, sorry to interrupt, it's sort of like um, the way I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's sort of like the antibiotics come in and they not only wipe out whatever bad bacteria you've got in there, but they also take out the good bacteria and therefore then the candida has like a blank slate to overgrow or to grow in and, and it goes wild. Yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's pretty much what it's like. I mean, antibiotics, I wouldn't say they would wipe out all the good bacteria, but they will take out some for sure. And then because it's such a delicate balance and it need, you know, we need all those healthy, good microbes, as soon as we do wipe out some of them, you're going to have a shift in both the gut environment and the vaginal environment. And then, yes, you're right, those, <laughs> those little funguses are going to go, woohoo. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so what are the, um, I guess, the because I guess if we're, if we're going off the stats, 75% of uh, listeners right now will have experienced thrush in their life. But can you just maybe share just the most common symptoms? Yes, absolutely. So itchiness would probably be one of the top ones. So itchiness around the vulva, so the outside of the vagina and inside the vagina. Um, and then another classic sign is a cottage cheese. It's like a curdy white discharge um, that you will often see, you know, if you had, had a look with a mirror or maybe you'd even wipe some out, you know, if you're wiping down there. Um, and then the vulva as well can be irritated, red, swollen. And you might have like a sweet or slight yeasty smell as well. Um, and some women will even experience a burning sensation, um, especially while um, they're having intercourse or while urinating. So, um, yeah, those are some of the classic symptoms of thrush. Okay. And how do we know if we're making it worse? So, I mean, in the past when I've had it like a straight after a course of antibiotics, it sort of comes on slowly. But are there, is there anything within that short window of time when it is sort of coming on that would make it worse, that would really aggravate symptoms that we should probably avoid? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of going back to those really key basics of 
making sure your blood glucose is balanced, uh, so eating healthy and balanced, um, supporting the immune system. Um, so one, looking at stress, two, maybe um, giving the immune system some extra support um, to help clear up any overgrowth or infection. Um, and you could, you know, you could potentially do that with probiotic supplements or through your food. So with probiotic food, so that might be like sauerkraut, miso, um, water kefir, yogurt, making sure it's sugar-free yogurt. Um, yeah, and then really, I mean, we don't, I don't think you can necessarily make it worse unless you're going to go thrash your body, yeah. you know, and go drink, drinking every night and sitting every night eating like bags of um, sugary foods and cakes and everything, you know. I think if, if overall, you know, you've adopted that lifestyle of 80, 20, 80% as, you know, healthy and balanced as possible, then, you know, I don't think you'll really make it worse. Um, it just what happens, you know, it just your body needs time to rebuild that microbiome again. Yeah. So support it, supporting it to be able to do that through diet, through um, reducing stress um, is going to make – you know, and a, a positive impact. Yeah, absolutely. I have two more questions about thrush before we move on to the next little bit. The first one is, would it go away on its own or do you think treatment is always necessary? Um, it can go away on its own, but if it doesn't, so if it's chronic or recurring, then usually some sort of treatment is necessary. Um, and there's, you know, there's definitely... You can know that you can go the medical route um, and go to the go to your GP. And it's, to be honest, it's always good to actually get it get checked and get a swab and make sure it is thrush because you know there are times where you think you had thrush, but it's actually, it actually could be something else. Um, so definitely, actually, you know, you don't even have to go to the GP. You can go to a sexual health clinic and get a swab, and they can let you know what the overgrowth is. Um, you know, it's not great to self-diagnose unless you you know you've got a, a history of it and you know that's what it is, but um yeah so um just, um what was your question again I'm just it, it, it would it go away on its own but I might just add oh, that's right. I might just add um, yeah. so obviously those are like there's obviously off the shelf stuff that you can purchase are yes. there any natural uh-huh. uh, natural ways we can support that rebalance of, of the bacteria Yes, cool. Yeah, so yeah, just to finish answering your question about it, will it go away, go away on its own? And then, you know, sometimes the body can mop it up, clear it up, um, which is amazing. But sometimes, you know, the body does need a little bit of assistance. Um, and I mean, there's there's definitely things you can do. Um, I I'm a big fan of Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a, a good yeast that you can get in supplement form and take that I find really helpful um so you would take that different... so you would take that once you've got it already yeah well it's actually good for preventative as well yeah. so if you know you have to go on go on antibiotics then i would take it during an antibiotic therapy as well mm-hmm. um yeah and then there's there are lots of different herbs that um, are useful as well and um one of them is uh horopito um which it's, it's such a cool herb, actually, because um, it naturally has learned to survive in the dark, damp forest of New Zealand. So New Zealand forests are actually, you know, often quite wet, damp and dark. And like um, you probably, I don't know if you've been into an old house before and in the bathroom where there's not good ventilation um, and then sometimes you can get mold growing in a, in a bathroom because it's damp. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not ventilating. And so the same thing, you know, in a rainforest, it's dark and damp. And fungus seriously loves to grow in the rainforest. And so that could actually, you can get trees and plants in the rainforest that um, have to find ways to fight against the fungus. And so they can survive as well. So Horopito's done that. It's such a clever plant. Um, and it's, it's got an active constituent called polygodile. Um, and it gives horopito a really hot, peppery taste. Um, but that polygodile is what's actually given the plant horopito the ability to survive um, in dark, damp conditions So, and fight against those forest funguses. Um, and, yeah, so horopitos can be a really awesome um, plant to help support vaginal health and balance the microbiome. Um, and because it's warming as well, it's um, a really good circulation support. So if, um, say, if you do feel like you've got a lack of good circulation, especially in the reproductive area, and you have a cold or a damp 
constitution um, and maybe a bit of stagnation in the pelvic area, then horopedo also, because it's warming, helps to really bring the blood flow, the lymphatic flow, the detoxification through the pelvic area. I'm um, always down to hearing uh, more alternate natural remedies because I have used the you know off off the shelf kind of solution, but I personally much prefer the more natural approach. So it's really awesome to be hearing this information. For my own curiosity, um, I have two questions. The first is how does the sup- how does it come as a supplement? Like, is it sort of a cream or a tablet? And when should we use it? Is this good for preventative style as well? So if I know I'm going to go on a course of antibiotics, can I utilize this plant and, and I guess the way it works as a preventative measure or is it just, um, you know, better as an intervention thing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, no, you can definitely use uh, as preventative. Actually, preventative medicine is, to be honest, I think the way we need to always go is how can we, you know, give our body their environment um, so that we're not always getting to the point where we're going to have to, you know, take... Put out fires. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, you're right. That's a good, that's a good way of putting, <laughs> putting out fires. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so it's, yes, and the horopedo does come. It comes in a wash and it comes in a cream. And you can use the wash every day. And that's actually just a lovely, gentle way of using um, the plant to support, the vagina, support your vaginal health. And, um, you know, and it's, um, you can also take it internally, but one of the, you know, whether or not you wanted to be taking it every day, um, you know, for the rest of your life, you know, that's not necessarily um, the answer, but it's definitely one of those plants that you can incorporate if you feel like you you do have a constitution that's colder and damper, or you do have a tendency towards thrush infections, um, because it will come in there and really help to support um, support vaginal health and balancing the microbiome. Yeah, love that. And obviously that is um, separate to what you can do through your diet and hydration, mm-hmm. I suppose. Um, but I quite like that just as an option. I think everyone listening will probably really appreciate that as well because I'm all about being uh, proactive rather than reactive, as we said, like instead of putting out the fires, I guess just doing a bit of back yes. burning first to make sure it doesn't go too crazy. Um, so yeah, I guess if mm. you know you've got a really stressful time or if you know your body and when I guess it's more prone to that imbalance where you start to feel those symptoms that are a bit uncomfortable and this might be something you want to look into and potentially research as a proactive measure. But I love that. That's that's mm. um, I've learned something new today. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I do want to chat to you a little bit about now cyclical living so talking about living with our cycle so what does that mean in your world and and how can we actually fully embrace that as a concept yeah absolutely oh great question um uh, cyclical living well it's essentially it's it's quite simple it's living in tune with the seasons of our life so whether that's the moon cycle our inner cycles so the menstrual cycle and nature seasons as well so the seasons around us Um, and just instead of, I don't know, I feel like it's easy just to be disconnected from essentially these beautiful cycles that hold us and support us. And they give us, um, a direct line back to ourselves, a checking in point, our groundedness. Um, and to be honest, I really find it's like a mindfulness practice every day working, you know, if you're going to use, for example, your menstrual cycle, so um, if you do have a natural bleed and um, you figure out which day of your cycle you're on, so day one is the first day of your flow. Um, and then, you know, each day just checking in and you might use an app or you might use a journal um, and asking yourself, you know, how are you feeling physically? How are you feeling emotionally, mentally and spiritually perhaps? Um, and then also going on to say, ask yourself, how can you show up for yourself today? in this version of yourself because as people and especially I know as a woman myself I'm always changing you know we're not the same every day Um, whether that's because of our hormones um, obviously having an impact on how we feel but also because of the seasons outside because of the moon cycles you know we're constantly evolving and changing and every day just wake up and expect ourselves to feel the same Um, you know we're actually we're not going to. We will sometimes feel more tired, need more space from people, maybe need some more protein in our diet, um, need more sleep, need more exercise, whatever it is. But if you can begin tracking that within yourself, tuning in, um, and it doesn't have to be 
um, a big thing. You can simply just maybe jot down one sentence or a few words to just say how you feel. So you might say, cycle day one, um, bleeding, fatigued, um, slight pain, feeling introverted, for example. Um, and then you can ask yourself, well, how can I best look after myself today with everything I've got to still show up for in my life? Um, you know, what ways can I care for myself, bring more calm into my life? Um, and if you don't bleed, um, you can you can use the moon phases because, you know, they also reflect quite similar to the menstrual cycle. So the new moon, the dark moon being like the bleeding phase and then the full moon being like ovulation um, and then, uh, then the waning moon, when it starts to reduce again, is like the luteal phase. So the moon's amazing as well. And I actually like to use both my menstrual cycle and the moon cycle as a way of checking in. Um, it's, I don't know. I just find it really grounding and really, really um, just a really powerful mindfulness practice. And it helps me feel more balanced in my life. Yeah. Um, have you – What? how about for you? No, I love that as a concept. Me personally, I think um, I'm very, very fortunate in the sense I have a regular cycle. So for me, I I haven't gone to the extent of, I guess, tracking and noting down how I feel, but I have a general, I guess, um, expectation of how I'm going to feel at different parts in the month. But I actually really like what you just suggested to actually write, you know, like day one bleed, how do I feel today? Because what I've noticed, especially during this period of lockdown, I had less distractions and so I was a lot more in tune or I guess I just had a lot more focus on how I was feeling every single day and I noticed how drastic my emotional uh, I guess state of being was depending on where I was in my cycle. And for me, that's like, mm. sometimes I'm just feeling a lot more emotional and my window of tolerance for stress is just so small that I get really overwhelmed very quickly or whatever the case may be. And, you know, for you, that's going to look something completely different. But what I really like about this as a concept is it really honors that no two days are the same. And it really goes to the heart of everything I talk about on the podcast with balance. And that is that, any day or any period in your life is going to be a unique combination of the areas being your health relationships and your fulfillment categories. And they're going to, mm. they're going to play a different role in your definition of balance. So at some points your health might be, you know, a, a large chunk of your balance and then you only have a small window left over for relationships and works, let's say for example. But what I like about this is it, it, it kind of repositions us to ask every morning or every day, what does my balance need to be today or, or what, how am I going to show up? Or how do I need to show up in each of these areas? And, you know, as, as a contrast, then what does my balance look like? Because I think there's all this pressure, especially for women to be it all and do it all, you know, be the perfect mums mm. whilst running a business, whilst working, whilst cleaning the house and cooking, doing all these things. And sometimes all you want to do is curl up in a ball and just show up for yourself. <laughs> and I think that that's yes, a yes. healthier thing to acknowledge. And I think if we, and I agree with you, what you said, it's, it's a very grounding practice, especially say if you were to do that with the elements. So something like the moon cycle or both. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a really refreshing way to just give yourself a little bit of power back and just bring a little bit more of a gentle approach to how you show up every day rather than, you know, being really frustrated that you're exhausted this week. I mean, I know sometimes for me, my cycle is, um, it takes a little bit more of a toll than me than say the last few months, last previous months. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, I think, I think this is a really nice idea for anyone who really just wants to connect with themselves on a deeper level, give themselves that flexibility and just, I think a little bit of gentleness, but, um, is this something yes, yeah. I guess that you do with your clients? And if so, have you noticed anything in particular in terms of the menstrual cycle and the flow on effects to, I guess, how we show up in life? Like, is there, are there any standout, uh, call outs you would make? Yeah, totally. Yeah, and uh, it's definitely is something I'd use I use with my clients um, and with and with myself in my daily life. But I think the biggest thing is it really does highlight the parts of the menstrual cycle which um, we have our strengths in. So some women naturally love ovulation or love pre-ovulation, and but when they get to premenstrual phase, they're really such a struggle. They struggle with the mood changes, the energy dropping feeling irritable and maybe for some women it's the mens uh, actually the bleeding phase which you know if they have heavy periods or painful periods but 
it just gives, it's like a, I like to call it like a direct line to your inner world and yourself and how you're feeling. And you'll, so you'll see your vulnerabilities, which are totally fine. Um, we all are vulnerable in different ways. And it also shows your strengths and it will show where you naturally, you know, you, you're good at showing up and you feel good and where you can maybe give yourself some extra care and love and parts of your cycle where you are more vulnerable. And for a lot of women, it is premenstrually. That seems to be the part of the cycle that, um, you know, bloating, digestion issues might come up. Emotional. That, those moods. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Which, you know what, it's, it's actually quite natural for that to happen to a ex certain extent because our hormones are shifting and changing and right at the end before we bleed, estrogen and progesterone are dropping right off before we bleed. And so when we have those drop of hormones, we're gonna f we will feel that turbulence, um, especially because progesterone, if we produce enough, is actually a really calming hormone. Um, and if we don't produce enough and we have an estrogen progesterone imbalance, we might feel those more premenstrual mood swings um, and those premenstrual struggles more. So it actually can give you information into your hormonal balance as well, which is really cool. Yeah, and it's all about just noticing and, and being aware. I guess that is the first step. But I love this yes, chat and yes. I, I guess it will uh, – it will give you that bit more confidence. I know sometimes in my cycle, like I almost forget my cycle's coming up and I'm just really, really emotional. And then I get my period like the next day and I'm like, oh, I knew, I knew <laughs> yeah. it. Like you kind of had that moment, like I knew I wasn't that emotional or, you know, you make, yes. you make a comment like that to yourself. <laughs> but I suppose if you, if you track it and you're aware, I guess, with how you're feeling, it lets you, I think it would just let you approach that day with a little bit more care and grace for yourself knowing, okay, I'm at, you know, the day before my bleed or, or around that I can expect to be a little bit more emotional so then when it comes it's not like this overwhelming shock which for some reason yeah. you know after years and years of having my period it still comes across as a shock to me <laughs> but um no yeah. I love that I yeah. love that with that was there anything else you would add or maybe a tip for anybody wanting to try this and sort of like where they can get started or how it's best to get started tracking this yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, what's quite cool too, like if you do start to notice that you've got some vulnerable points in your cycle, you might want to um, schedule your life a little bit different, maybe not um, be as busy on those days or not schedule in social things. Um, you know, you can start to actually go, you know, I'm going to not completely organize your life around it. You know, we need to be flexible, but as well, you know, you can actually um, create a life that works for you um, and do th do more work, maybe work longer hours on those days you feel you like you've got more energy. Um, or you might actually have a part of your cycle, like for me, when I'm premenstrual, I'm so much more creative and I get into this zone where I can focus. Um, so I find I can get a lot done premenstrually. Um, so I find that really useful. That's um, Yeah, that's really, and, really cool. Yeah, and then I guess to start off with, like, I mean, if you want to use an app, um, I really love Kandara, Read Your Body, and Clue is quite good as well. I mean, there's so many cycle tracking apps now. Um, so, you know, just find an app that you like. You can use that. Or if you want to keep away from your phone, which is always nice to do, um, you could buy yourself a, a special journal even and just, you know, jot, jot on the date, the, the, your cycle day you're on. And if you're not bleeding or you're on contraception, you could just use the moon cycle day as well. Um, and then, yeah, you put in, put down how you're feeling in your body, your mind and your soul and maybe finish with how can you show up for yourself today um, or in this part of your cycle. Let's say if, if it was your, say, your bleeding phase and you're on your period and you do get quite a lot of cramps, you know, maybe you could put in some self-care things like a hot bath or, you know, some slow nights at home cuddled up with a movie or a book, um, you know, and you can start to kind of figure out what your self-care needs are for your different parts of your cycle. Yeah, I love that. And I think this has something really nice to say about motivation as well, because I fully um, I fully feel that as well, like at some parts of the month, because I do strength training as well. So for me, it's very apparent when I feel physically stronger or not. And I need to, I guess, take a step mm. back. So training around my cycle is one thing. But you just inspired me by, by noting that you feel that creativity. And I do notice I mm. go through like sprints of I'm super motivated and kind of like really, really productive. And then there are moments where I need like a couple days to kind of reset. So I'm going to actually over the next month 
be very conscious of how my, I guess, performance levels are in relation to my cycle. Cause that can really help, mm. I guess, with, you know, if I know I've got the, my, when I'm ovulating, I'm super productive, then I can schedule in like my more, I guess, uh, brain required type work. And then maybe on the other weeks where I need to be a bit slower, that's maybe I could do like the more laid back type stuff. So I think that's also a really cool way to, I guess, hack your productivity or, rather than i guess waiting for your motivation to kick in this is kind yeah, of like a hack, a hack yeah. to work out when you're going to be or feel most productive so i really really love this as a concept and i'm pledging to everybody now and to you that i'm going to try it next <laughs> month so i'll report back and let you know how i go but i'm really excited to oh, cool. um, to see how that goes so thank you so much for suggesting that's cool. You might actually find too that um, around ovulation, you do better strength training because we actually have a boost of testosterone just before we ovulate. And so having that extra testosterone in our bodies can actually improve um, workout, um, our workouts and our strength training. So maybe even have a look into that and see if that correlates for you. Mm, and I'll, I'll have to schedule in my PBs that week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally <laughs> awesome cool. all right just before i let you go i did want to chat a little bit about fertility and um conception so yeah i guess when we're talking about our cycle and and i guess this conversation is going to be separate to um conditions such as like pcos or endo or anything like that that um, we don't have time to really yeah. go into today but i guess i just wanted to ask some high level questions the first one is how soon before trying to fall pregnant should we be preparing or even thinking about it? Because, you know, I'll just, uh, to, to be quite uh, honest with everyone on the podcast, like that's something I'm potentially feeling or looking at in maybe three years time. That's something my partner and I have discussed, but I kind of don't even know like how soon before that time frame I should be thinking or preparing my body. So do you have any thoughts around that? Yeah, totally. Look, at least three months before, which is not even that long before, can you know you start trying. What's so ideal? ideally, if you can't, um, you know, it's really going to depend on the person and what other underlying health issues there are. If you're overall quite healthy and you do have a regular menstrual cycle, then you might find six months is quite an ideal um, point. You know, you can really start to up up some of your self-care practices and really focus on fertility um because you've got to think too you've got to make it sustainable um if you did it a year before you might find it too you know such a long period of time you might run out of st steam for it um so maybe around the six month mark if you are re you know pretty healthy but if you did perhaps have some other underlying reproductive issues um then definitely looking at probably a year before um so, but then, you know, equally, even three months before is still awesome. Um, anything is awesome, really, because, um, you know, whatever we do to optimize our health is going to have impact on, on our egg health and our pregnancy health. Yeah, absolutely. And so what are some of those things that you would be looking at doing or some of the things you work with your clients to do within that, let's just say, three to six month window before they're trying to fall pregnant? Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, so getting some basic blood tests. So if you've got a good GP, um, pop to your GP, ask for um, some preconception blood tests. Um, these might include zinc, uh, which you do with copper at the same time because you need to know your zinc and copper ratio. Um, iron studies, B12, folate, full blood count, hematology, um, vitamin D you might want to even do and I think they'll do it for you um, if you ask for a preconception test um, an STI check as well um, and, a, and a vaginal swab make sure you know your vagina microbiome is healthy and balanced there's no infections down there um, so yeah definitely going in to see your trusted um, general practitioner and you know get a bunch of just basic tests done um, because let's for example if you did have low iron you know you really want to boost your iron up as much as you can because um, you know, you will lose a lot of iron over pregnancy potentially. So uh, making sure your nutrition status is optimal. Um, so that's one of the probably first things I'd suggest. And then looking at the different areas of your life. So supporting, you might want to do a three month detoxification, like a light, it doesn't have to be a heavy detoxification, but just supporting your liver, supporting your bowels with elimination, um, once again, looking at nutrition status, um, so really focusing on as much healthy, vibrant food. And if you can afford it, choose organic, spray-free food because um, you want to really reduce those 
the input of um, chemicals and synthetic fertilizers, which will be found on a lot of conventional food. Um, and then purifying your water if you can as well. So finding, it doesn't have to be a fancy filter, but something at least to get rid of the chlorine and heavy metals out of the water um, would be really useful. And going on like a good quality preconception multi, um, and there are lots of different brands. I won't recommend anyone in particular, but looking at one with activated folate would be really handy. So you could pop to a health food store or talk to your naturopath or nutritionist about that one. Um, and then you're reducing caffeine. So, I mean, if you can go caffeine free, that's amazing. Um, but even if you just, you know, just have one coffee a day, or one tea a day, that would be much better than, you know, three or four a day. So you're yeah, getting the caffeine consumption down. And ultimately, if you can, no alcohol for the three months before you start to try um, would be really useful. And then, like, stress as well, because, you know, when the body's stressed, um, it's less likely to want to fall pregnant. Um, well, it's it one, of those, one of those systems that gets deprioritized, right? They go, it goes into fight yeah. or flight and it thinks we just need to digest and breathe yes. right now so we don't need to reproduce. So yes. I can fully yeah. um, grasp why stress would be, like, a big, big barrier to falling pregnant sometimes. Yeah, absolutely, and it can be for some women. Um, it can be very impactful so you know really focusing on relaxation mindfulness and figuring out what those things are that help calm you because you know we're all really different um and i think well one, one thing i like to think of stress can get caught up in our bodies so if we can move the stress out of our bodies so whether that's through dancing walking yoga singing even like i think sometimes when things get trapped in our bodies that's where we get stagnation and blockages so, you know, trying to get the stress out of our body and finding the practices that calm you because everyone is different, you know, what they find relaxing. Um, so, you know, if you love meditation or you might love to just um, go for ocean swims, whatever that is, find those things and try put them into your daily routine every day. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to movement, I think too is just not overdoing exercise because exercise is – can be stressful on the body and release stress hormones. So really kind of bringing exercise down to a more calming type of movement. We want to be moving, absolutely, it's crucial. But, you know, it's maybe just the nature walks, um, the yoga, the stretching. Um, you know, you can do strength training for sure, um, but just, you know, reducing the high, high intensity that would release the cortisol into the body. Um, just, you know, for those three months before and when you're trying, I would suggest that. Mm hmm Interesting. And so would yeah. that be the case even if you already are regularly doing strength training? Uh, that's a good question. Look, once again, it's going to depend on each person. And look, if you feel that overall your your stress levels are great, you're managing and it's not actually um, a negative thing for you, um, then it might actually be totally fine to continue. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if someone, if someone isn't doing strength training and a high intensity workouts and all of a sudden they want to, they might, or, or they have a lot of other stress in their life and things going on and they have too much cortisol, then I probably would suggest really focusing on calming movements, slower yeah. movements. So it's, it's really going to be unique to the person. I wouldn't say it's one size fits all for exercise. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And as is probably everything else you've said on the um, podcast <laughs> as well, it's kind of take yeah. it with a grain of salt and, and absolutely to yes. work with a professional like yourself, if you are in that state and need yes. a bit of support. But I feel like often, and this will probably be my last question, often the onus is always on women to, you know, get their bodies in a great state, make sure their egg health is optimal, make sure that their bodies and minds are aligned. What about for mm. men? You know, for any ladies listening mm. that want to pass on some info, if we still got any males tuned in to this episode, you know, what are some things they can do? Because I, I guess like sperm quality and count is also super important uh, or half the, mm. half the importance in uh, falling pregnant. So are there any things that you would suggest for males in this process? as well mm, yeah definitely and now you have men that just as important because the sperm health you know is crucial as well um and like it, you know the life cycle of a sperm cell is just over i think it's about two months so there's that sort of space you know that three month kind of space where you, is important as well for men to really hone in and um optimize their health as well which was, will have a knock-on effect to their sperm health um, and, there, you know, there's particular nutrients that men can look at 
taking once again you know it's best to work with the practitioner um, to do an individualized plan but you know zinc is crucial for sperm health um, coq10 which is a antioxidant um, that can be really useful uh, looking at selenium levels as well and once again uh, you can get now some really great multivitamins for men for preconception um, so yeah there's um, definitely you know getting your partner onto a good preconception multi as well um, and then for them just reducing stress is a big one um, and then like depending on the industry that either of you work in you know maybe looking at heavy metal um, detoxification um, you know, optimizing gut health, like really, to be honest, what the woman does, the man, I think, needs to come along to the party and do as well. Um, we're both, you know, you're both, you're both in it together, the sperm and the egg meet together and create, you know, create this beautiful baby. So they, the health of both is crucial. Um, yeah, definitely don't want to overlook the sperm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I might have to do a separate episode on uh, male, <laughs> male health, but I definitely <laughs> think everything you said for a woman is definitely applicable for a man as well. So good to hear that they can play their part too. I just think often we don't think about it. It's always just about like woman's body getting her ready to, you know, hold the child, but really it is um, a 50, 50 split. So thanks for sharing your thoughts on that. And I have learned a lot out of our chat today. I'm really glad um, we got you on and we got past all our technical difficulties, but <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. I know our listeners as well would have taken a lot out of today. If they do want to connect with you a little bit further or follow along your journey or your work where's the best place they can do so cool yeah well you can um contact me through colorex as well if you pop onto the colorex website colorex.com.au um there is a blog on there um introducing myself um so yeah that's probably the best way to contact me through there and um yeah i'd love to you know if any questions around vaginal health um thrush uh, happy to help and support you know, with any, any of those sort of re reproductive questions. Uh, it's definitely my favorite area. Amazing. And um, I'll pop a link to that in the show notes below, but just quickly, because I know you're obviously New Zealand based. Do you do online consults at the moment as well? I do. Yes. That's separate to Colorex. For Colorex, I do, yeah, this the customer um, questions, but yeah, I do work as well um, as a naturopath um, for, in my own practice. Yes. Okay. Beautiful. And, um, and I do that online as well yeah okay great for anyone listening that potentially wants to go down that road there's a little bit of an info for you but thank you so much for your time it was really great having you on the show and um i hope you have a great rest of your week thank you thank you too i'm glad that we got the conversation <laughs> working after all that absolutely <laughs> cool awesome thank you so much i appreciate it. it's been great to chat <laughs> And that's a wrap for this week, Balancers. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you found this episode useful to some degree in either steering or determining your definition of balance today. As always, the biggest compliment for us is if you share this episode with someone who you feel might need it, or if you're on Spotify, you can click follow or on Apple Podcasts, you can leave a rating or review. If you have any suggestions for up and coming podcasts, feel free to shoot us a DM or an email. Our Instagram is at the balance theory and our email is the balance theory podcast at gmail.com. Otherwise you've always got the option of subscribing to our mailing list. We only send you email reminders when the episodes drop. So you get them fresh out of the oven. No annoying spam. We promise. I hope you enjoy the rest of your week and until next time, stay balanced. Oh, stop, 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 stop.